Hello and welcome back. In this video we'll be looking at section 1.5. We're going to talk about bias in sampling and we're going to explore some of the sources of bias in sampling. Remember from our previous sections the purpose of conducting a study in statistics is to be able to measure some characteristic of a sample and use that to draw a conclusion about the larger population. It's almost never possible to measure every member of a population, but if we could measure a sample and then use that to draw a conclusion about the population, that's the next best thing. There are two types of errors that can cause a statistic taken from a sample to be different from a parameter, which remember is a measure of a population. Sampling error and non-sampling error, and that ought to just about cover it, right? First of all, sampling error. This is just simply due to the fact that we are using a sample instead of measuring the actual population. It doesn't mean that we've made a mistake or done anything wrong at all. It's just because of the inherent difference between a sample and the population it came from. It can't be helped. Non-sampling error is pretty much everything else. Non-sampling error includes any error that is not due to sampling error which is the natural difference between the population and the sample. Non-sampling error includes sampling bias, non-response bias, and response bias, and also data entry error. Okay, first of all, what do we mean by sampling bias? Sampling bias means that the technique used to obtain the sample's individuals tends to favor one part of the population over another, in other words, the sample was chosen incorrectly. Convenience sampling always leads to a sampling bias. Under coverage occurs when the proportion of one segment of the population is lower in the sample than it is in the population. Here's a famous example of sampling bias. In 1936, the Literary Digest predicted that Alfred Landon would defeat Franklin Roosevelt. Their sample was drawn from a list of their subscribers, registered automobile owners, and telephone directories. But in 1936, we were at the height of the Great Depression. Only wealthy voters had money for things like phones and cars, so the sample suffered from undercoverage of Democrats, and the results were wrong. And here's another famous example of sampling bias just a few years later. In 1948, many polling organizations used a method of sampling called quota sampling, which is similar to stratified sampling, but instead of doing a simple random sample from within each strata, the researchers were free to choose any individuals they wanted within each quota group. And this resulted in a sampling bias because the members of each quota group were selected by convenience. And remember, convenience sampling always leads to problems. The Chicago Daily Tribune made the call based on flawed polls and the early election results, and that resulted in this famous photo where President Truman is holding up a newspaper that says Dewey defeats Truman. And as it turns out, he's smiling because the headline turned out to be wrong. Okay, now let's talk about non-response bias. Non-response just happens when people who are selected to be in a study refuse to participate. So, for example, when a pollster calls your house and you say, sorry, I don't have time to talk, and you hang up on them, you're a non-response in that case. So when that happens a lot, it can affect the sample. Now, non-response bias can be improved by callbacks. It can also be improved by offering rewards or incentives. For example, we've all gotten those receipts where at the bottom of the receipt it says, call to participate in this survey and we'll put you in the drawing for a $500 gift card. That's a reward that they're offering to cut down on non-response. Okay, then response bias exists when the answers on a survey do not reflect the true feelings of the respondent. For example, interviewer error. The interviewer must be able to get truthful responses to uncomfortable questions. Also, the sponsor of the survey should not have a vested interest in the outcome. So, when somebody gives a half-hearted answer to an interviewer and instead of probing a little deeper to find out how that person really feels, he just goes ahead and records whatever they said the first time around, that's interviewer error. And then we have misrepresented answers. 
Okay, one source of misrepresented answers is that people frequently do not realize the truth about themselves, and they may unconsciously misrepresent weight or height or eating habits or work habits. You know, if somebody asks you, what's your weight? Are you going to tell them what your scale said this morning? Or are you going to tell them what your scale says after you've been dieting for a week or so? Most of us would like to report the number that would make us feel better about ourselves. And another problem is people may give what they consider the more socially desirable answer instead of telling the truth. So if people know that their opinion is unpopular, they frequently will not honestly give that opinion even to a pollster who is a stranger. And another source of response bias is the wording of questions, and this is a very big problem. Questions have to be balanced, presenting both sides of an issue, and the question should be very specific. The wording of the question should not give a hint about the right answer. If it does, that's called a leading question, and that's never right. The ordering of words or questions is important. If the same option is presented first every time, it will get chosen more often. Researchers vary the order of choices to account for this. Here's an example of a response bias due to misrepresented answers. The fellow says to the pollster, put me down for whoever comes out ahead in your poll. See, people like to be in the popular group. They don't like to be part of the unpopular. So probably somebody wouldn't be this upfront about it, but they might say what they think is the correct answer, so to speak. And here's an example of a leading question. The pollster says, do you agree that national polls are fair and unbiased, or are you some kind of moron? Well, nobody wants to admit to being a moron, so of course, unless she's on to him, she'll agree that national polls are fair and unbiased. And then finally, in the non-sampling error category, data entry errors. Because we're human and mistakes happen, so this kind of error where you say yes, but the pollster accidentally clicks no, that kind of thing goes in the non-sampling error category. Okay, we're going to look at a few situations together and see if we can determine the type of bias and see if we can come up with a remedy for that bias. And our first situation is this. A retail store manager wants to conduct a study regarding the shopping habits of his customers. He selects the first 60 customers who enter his store on a Saturday morning. Okay, so this is a non-sampling error, and we want to determine what type of bias is leading to this non-sampling error. It could be response bias or non-response bias or sampling bias. And here's what I say. Since he selects the first 60 customers who enter his store on a Saturday morning, he's not getting a good cross-section of all the customers throughout the week or even all day Saturday. He's just getting Saturday morning. And those people all were motivated to get up and get dressed and get out of the house. And so their outlook on things might be different from the rest of the customers that are there the rest of the week. So I would say that this is a sampling bias. It's a convenience sample and therefore it has led to a sampling bias. And what he could do to fix this is sample customers throughout the week and whenever he samples, sample throughout the day so that you make sure you're getting daytime shoppers and nighttime shoppers, weekday shoppers and weekend shoppers. Here's another situation. An anti-gun advocate wants to estimate the percentage of people who favor stricter gun laws. He conducts a nationwide survey of 1,203 randomly selected adults 18 years and older. The interviewer asks, do you favor harsher penalties for individuals who sell guns illegally? So think about whether you think this is response bias or non-response bias or sampling bias. Well, I'm going to say that this is response bias because there's a problem with his question. So type of bias, this is response bias. It's a leading question. Do you favor harsher penalties for individuals who sell guns illegally? I mean, you want to say yes, right? Because you feel like people who are selling guns illegally should be punished, and that's a bad thing. So, of course, I favor harsher penalties. But wait a minute. Do we even know what the penalties are right now? You know, what if the penalty for selling guns illegally is 50 years in jail? Well, that might be harsh enough. I'm not sure... How can somebody say they favor harsher penalties unless they know what the existing penalties are? 
So this is a leading question, and it's also too vague of a question. So what he might do is reword the question. He could say, the current penalty for selling a gun without required background checks is five years in prison. Do you believe this penalty is too light, about right, or too harsh? And notice how now he's given them options. He's presented all the options instead of just saying, do you favor harsher penalties? Even here, though, they would want to rotate these options because people will tend to land on the first one that they hear. Here's another one. Suppose you are conducting a survey regarding the sleeping habits of students. From a list of registered students, you choose a simple random sample of 150 students. The survey question is, how much sleep do you get? Okay, so type of bias. It does not seem to be a sampling bias because it says they used a simple random sample, not a convenient sample, so that's good. I do see a problem here with how much sleep do you get. It just seems like an awfully broad question. It doesn't say if we're talking about sleep at night or would that include nap times because you know sometimes college students are going to sack out in the afternoon and then be up half the night. It's just not specific enough and it also doesn't tell people whether we're expecting answers to the nearest hour or to the nearest half hour or maybe we are expecting a range of time like six to eight hours three to four hours you know it just needs to be more specific than this so since we have a wording problem that's going to be a response bias and the remedy is to reword the question we could maybe say something like how many hours of sleep do you usually get per night and you might even want to be more specific and say, on a weeknight. So it depends, but the way we started out was just too broad. And another one. A polling organization conducts a study to estimate percent of households that speak a foreign language as a primary language. It mails a form to 1,023 randomly selected households and 12 respond. Okay, that's not a lot. If they sent out 1,023 surveys and they only got 12 back, I would say that the type of bias is non-response bias because that's just not enough responses. The remedy might be to send people to these houses or use phone calls to increase response because there may be a language barrier there. If these people speak a foreign language as their primary language and they don't speak English, then when they get a card in the mail that doesn't seem like real business that they need to tend to, they may throw it in the trash. And that may be why they're getting not very many responses. So phone calls and visits may be more effective here. And one last one. A newspaper article reported the Cosmo magazine survey of more than 5,000 Australian women aged 18 to 34 found 42% considered themselves overweight or obese. Now, I would imagine most women aged 18 to 34, if they are even an ounce overweight, they will probably call themselves overweight. But I would think a lot of people would probably resist calling themselves obese because that sounds like a problem that's gone too far. So, you know, just the wording of this question bothers me. So I'm going to say there's a response bias here due to misrepresented answers because people are not always honest even with themselves about their weight. And the remedy is either to measure the height and weight of the sample participants to determine which ones are truly overweight or if the focus is more on finding out about people's perception of themselves, maybe we need to give them guidelines about what's considered overweight and what's considered obese before we ask them, do you consider yourself overweight or obese? And maybe that would help cut down on the misrepresented answers. So bottom line, after you've chosen the sample, a lot more goes into making sure that you're going to get the information you need from the study. So the way the researcher words the questions and the way the researcher handles the members of the sample still can have a large impact on the results of the study.